be a blessing to Middleburg and the surrounding areas. Um, bless Renus as he delivers this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Solid ground. Let's give the band a hand. They served us so well this morning. So good. Before I get into the preaching, um, I just had a sense as we were, were standing here worshiping this morning, uh, there are some of you that's quite new to our context of, of doing church. Um, some of you are here for the baby dedications and whatever we've done this morning may be a bit strange, a bit weird, <laughs> maybe a bit different to what you are used to when it comes to serving God. And... Um, yeah, I just want to say, will you give God's word a chance this morning? No matter how weirded out you are by the context and the, the style that we've done things in this morning. Um, I'm actually, if you haven't noticed by my accent, I'm actually Afrikaans. So I want to speak to Afrikaans guys this morning or families here this morning. Mark nie saak hoe vreemd van ochend vele was nie. En tot op hierdie punt mag dit dalk baie snaaks gelijk het en, en anders as wat ons gewoond is. Sal jy die Heere sy woord kans geef vanochtend? Sal jy hart sag maak en ontvang wat die Heere vir jou het vanochtend? So will you receive what Jesus has for you this morning? Is that good? Amen. You can open your Bibles and even if the, even if the French or British or whatever I'm speaking up here is a bit uh, weird for you, hang in there. I'm sure God will bring you translation. Uh, you can open your Bibles uh, in Acts 15. We are in a new series, uh, uh, preaching through the book of Galatians. I'm starting that today, so I'll give a little bit of introduction to the book of Galatians, and then we'll see how far we can get uh, in Galatians 1. Um, buckle up your, your seat belts because the, the series title is No More Vomit. Yes, I said it. No more vomit. <laughs> and I'm going somewhere with that. I'm going somewhere with that. But you're going to have to sit through the sermon to get to that, so don't run out quite yet. Um, so if we're preaching on Galatians, why are we in Acts 15? Because in Acts 15, there's an event that happens that explains the context of Galatians so well. And even though what happens in Acts 15... Uh, relates to an event in Antioch and not in Galatians, it just explains it so well. So I felt to read this Acts 15 verse 1 to 12, just to give us, give us some context of where the Galatian church find themselves and why Paul felt it needed to write this letter to the Galatians. Uh, you can also keep your finger on Galatians 1. Uh, we will get there soon, but Acts 15 for now. Acts 15 from verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, uh, Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to, to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this issue. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, uh, describing in detail the conversions of the Gentiles uh, as, they brought great joy, as, as they brought great joy to all the brothers and sisters. Now, just about this word Gentile, if you are not a Jew, as in by blood descent, you are a Gentile in, in biblical terms. So these were people that were not of Jewish descent, that received Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and, 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 and um, Paul and Barnabas and some, some others are traveling back to Jerusalem with, with this question, should these guys um, be circumcised in order to be saved? Just to give some context to that. From verse 4, when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. Uh, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, now remember the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, Pharisees and Sadducees, and um, they were the religious leaders. And these stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Speaking of the Gentile believers now, that they should be circumcised and 
keep to the law of Moses in order to secure their salvation. The apostles and the elders gathered to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles uh, would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. So even though they were not circumcised, even though they were not holding to the law of Moses, these Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit, just as us, meaning just as we did in the day of Acts, in the early day of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. You can read that first account in Acts 10, I think it is, where, where the household of Cornelius receives the Holy Spirit. He made no distinction between us and them, verse 9, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. We are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way they are. Make note of that sentence. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Let's close our eyes. Father God, we bless your word this morning. Uh, will you bless your word to our hearts? Will you open our hearts, Father God? I pray that any preconceived ideas about your word, about our faith, about uh, your gospel, Lord, will you, will you break open our hearts? Will you take hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of flesh? I pray that every seed spoken this morning will fall and fill fertile soil. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, much like what was happening in Antioch in Acts 15, was happening in the Galatian church. Young Gentile converts of the churches of Galatia who accepted Paul's gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone uh, in Jesus Christ, was being persuaded by religious Judea, Judaizers, Judea, Judea, how do I pronounce that? Judaizers, no, they zers. Okay, so these were Jewish converts to Christianity, okay, just by those guys. So these guys came in and they tried to convince the young Gentile believers in Galatia that they should add to the requirement, that they should add the requirements of the Mosaic law to their lives to complete their salvation. Okay, so in order to complete your salvation, you had to add the letter of the Mosaic law to your salvation. This is what these guys came in and taught. The Apostle Paul vigorously opposed these religious teachings and urgently pleaded with the church uh, to return to the truth of the gospel of grace that he proclaimed to them. I think one of the key passages in Galatians is found in 5 verse 1. He says, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. It means that they've been, they've been submitting before to the yoke of slavery and don't do it again because you have been set free. You once were under the yoke of slavery, but now you've been set free and don't go back to that. Don't submit again to that. The message says it this way, Christ has set us free to live a free life. Say free. free. Say freedom. freedom. That's a big theme in the book of Galatians. Christ has set us free to li live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. So do not be enslaved again. You see, Christianity, friends, is the only system of faith in the world where you do not have to work for or earn your salvation. Entrance into the glory of the afterlife or acceptance and favor with your maker is not subject to works in Christianity. It's subject to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Whilst all other religions, including the, the, the religions that these Galatian uh, believers had been saved and set free from, every other religion in the world says do this and do that, achieve this and achieve that, and worship here and make pilgrimage there. It's all these do's and don'ts. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, come to me as you are, I will give you life. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that we subscribe to and teach is that Jesus lived the perfect life that we cannot. God punished Jesus so that you and I do not have to be punished. 
which means the gospel equals Jesus in my place. He got, he got punished for something he didn't do in our place so that we don't have to get punished for it. Do you see how the gospel works and how the gospel is contrary to that of other religions and other faith systems in the world and even religious Christianity? Because even as we will see, religious Christianity opposes that thought. There is nothing you can do to work for, earn, or add to your salvation and favor with God. You cannot earn it. You can't work for it. Go read Ephesians 2. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that we earn God's favor. He loves you, forgives you, cleanses you, accepts you, sets you free, and saves you. All on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Not on the basis of what you have done or not have done or have not done. Other religions say, do, do, do. Jesus says, done, done, done. That is a nutshell of Galatians. Longest introduction in introduction history. Maybe I've gone longer, I don't know. Galatians 1, let's get to the passage. From verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now Paul opens his letter with a similar but seemingly different style or, or, or a slightly different greeting to every other pastoral uh, letter that we see. On, on face value, initially it looks very similar. This, this seems like a pretty standard uh, greeting for Paul. Uh, in his introduction, he, uh, uh, Paul affirms and almost defensively affirms his apostleship. Uh, he says, Paul, an apostle, he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ. So it seems like he's a, a little bit defensive in that uh, greeting of his. And, um, and, 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 and in this, he cements that he was called by God, not by man. So he's apostle called by God, not by man. And it immediately gives us a sense that there'd been opposition. Somewhere, they'd come some, somebody had come into the church and said, no, Paul's not a real apostle. Somebody had come in, some false teachers had come in and opposed Paul's apostleship, and he feels to defend it. And later on in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book, we see he, or in the letter, we see he, he, he goes back to that argument. But uh, he, he, he starts his message with, I am apostle by Christ Jesus, not by man. Then he carries on in verse 3, grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our, of our God and Father. To him be glory and glory, uh, glory forever and ever. Amen. Now in Christ we find our joy and freedom in the grace, peace and knowledge that we've been set free and that we are being set free, that we've been rescued, and that we are being rescued. Remember the, the argument that salvation is a, is a once-off work, but it's also a continuous work that will one day come into fulfillment when Christ returns. So we've been rescued, so we've been justified by the faith that we put in Jesus Christ. As we walk this journey of, of our Christian walk, we are being set free from the sinful nature in our lives, and gradually we are being sanctified. And then one day we will be fully set free. But, but Paul's, uh, Paul opens his letter and he says, Thank God who has rescued us and he is rescuing us from this present evil age. How many of us can agree that we are living in a present evil age? When last did you see social media? I think we've just gone through a whole series arguing this matter. So we don't need to get into that much more. But we, we all know that we are living in a present evil age and that we all need rescuing from it. As we walk our journey with the Lord. So far this seems like a pretty standard greeting for Paul. But instead of going into a typical affirmation and thanksgiving and praise discourse as he usually does in verse 6. Um, Paul turns immediately to rebuking the, the Galatians. Uh, picking up in verse 6 he says, I am amazed. The NIV says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning uh, to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some of you, or there are some who are troubling you, 
and want to distort, other translation says pervert, you see the strong language, astonish people who want to pervert or distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone, say anyone, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. Paul has deep concern and deep urgency for this church. Instead of affirming them and lovingly, you know, sort of coming beside them, he goes straight down to the point that he's writing to them for. And, and, and there's this urgency and this abruptness in his language and, and, and just like the strong language that tells us that Paul's, Paul's heart is really troubled by what is happening in the Galatian church. You see, the word gospel in the Greek is evangelion, which literally means the good news. Paul speaks much about the gospel, the gospel, and there's a false gospel and there's a true gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified is not just some good news, friends. It is the good news. Capital letter T, the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, not, is the only good news that bridges the relational gap between creator and creature. There is no other good news that can bridge that gap between crea crea creator and creature. It is the only good news that transforms a person or transforms a person from slave to son and from enemy to heir. That is what the gospel does. That is what the good news of Jesus Christ does. And it's the only good news out there that can do it. There is no other good news. Any other good news is false news or seemingly good news is false news. Are we good? Amen. John 14 verse 6, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, say no one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ, friends, is the only good news there is. There is no other good news. Later on in Galatians, more strong language, Paul says in Galatians 3 verse 1, You foolish Galatians. Who likes to be called a fool? They must have been quite offended at this letter initially. Eh? I think there were some knee-jerk reactions to this letter. Some of them were like, hey, I dare you call me a fool. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed and crucified. What he's saying is, how could you so easily be convinced otherwise to turn to another gospel, to another good news? There is none. Jesus Christ is the good news of salvation. Now, at this point, we can easily stand and criticize the Galatians. I mean, they had the message from the Apostle Paul. They were on the right track. And as, as, a, as, as, as a believer myself, sometimes I stand on my little pedestal and I criticize. And we can easily fall into that trap with that look of surprise and disgust on your face. How dare you? How dare you, you foolish Galatians? How dare you fall so quickly from it? But I want to say to you, how many of us have fallen prey to the idea of another gospel? This whole week, this, this, this idea of don't throw stones when you live in a glass house. It's dangerous. It's dangerous, friends. Because this message, the, the, I believe much of the Bible is like a mirror. It should be read like a mirror. Even though this message is written to the Galatians, I need to see myself. The gospel makes me see myself in these, in these words that's written. It's the book of life. It's, it's, it's the book that gives life. And, it, and it, the message should, should reflect back at me. How many of us, when things get a bit tough... Or things don't quite go as, as we want them to go. The first thing we think is maybe I should get a little bit more involved in the church. Or maybe I, I should pray a little bit more. Or maybe I should read my Bible a little bit more. Or maybe I should do this or do that. Do, 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 do. Now while reading your Bible and going to church and praying is all good things, friends. When the motive of the heart is to try and earn God's favor and to earn a better life and to earn something from God by giving more finances to the church, you think you're going to earn more, you're going to get more, your finances are struggling. Instead of God working in your heart 
and, and, and doing a deep work in your heart, you think that something that you do can earn God's favor. You foolish Galatians. You foolish Renus. You foolish church. The gospel is not a gospel of do. It's a religious spirit that deeply entrenches our hearts. And we should resist it. Or perhaps you have the theological understanding this morning that in some way or another your morality, your good or bad works or deeds in some way plays a role in the likelihood of you going to heaven. This two friends is a gospel of works. It is a false doctrine. It is a false gospel and it will lead to nothing. It will lead to your destruction because your whole life will be, will, be, will be bent around trying to please God out of your works and trying to earn God's favor out of your works. Good works is not a bad thing, friends, but good works should spill over from your relationship with Christ. It should be the, the result and the fruit of your relationship with Christ. It's not to earn God's, not God's favor or to earn your salvation. You foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. Your foolish readiness who has bewitched you. Maybe you can put your own name in there. You can pick on Amos, you foolish Amos, who has bewitched you. Proverbs 26 verse 11 says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so also a fool repeats his foolishness. You see, turning from the gospel of grace to a false gospel of religion and moral works is like a dog returning to its own vomit. Paul is saying to the Galatians, no more vomit. Don't return again to the vomit of your previous lives. Repeat after me, no more vomit. No, say it like you mean it, no more vomit. Do not turn to the vomit of your former beliefs of having to work for your salvation and acceptance, friends. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You have been set free from the bondage and slavery of your former belief, your former self, who you once were. You've got a new identity, which is in Christ. Your new address is in Christ. Amen. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone. It has fallen away. God gives you a new identity. But for some reason, there's this hardwired thing in my heart that always finds its way to come to the front where I cannot fully grasp the goodness of the gospel. And before I know it, I'm on, way, on, way, on my way back to that puddle of puke. How does it happen? How does it happen that when things go tough, I turn to God and say, God, but I tithe. Why? You see, this is a wrong gospel, friends. God, but I'm, I'm a pastor. I preach your word. This is a wrong gospel, friends. I return to that puddle of puke because I don't grasp God's gospel. Because I feel like my works should qualify me for something greater. My works should qualify me for God's favor and for good things. While well, Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished. No more. No more. If religion and works is a false gospel, then those who preach and promote it are false teachers and false prophets. And the Bible says they will reap their reward for leading people astray. Anyone who wants to persuade you of another gospel is a false teacher and should be cursed by God, is what Paul is saying in this passage. If you, friend, if, if, if you get a little bit of a kick out of somebody standing up and mixing a little bit of law into their grace message, friends, it's a false gospel. It will lead you astray. No more vomit. Let's not return to the ways of our former self. 1 verse 10, Galatians 1 verse 10. For I'm now trying to persuade, or for am I now trying to persuade people or God? Rhetorical question. 
Or am I striving to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. When I read this, something else rang in my head. That moment in Acts 4 where Peter and John stands in front of the Sanhedrin and being accused of, 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 of not, not following the ways of the law. In Acts 4 verse 19, it says, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you, or, 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 or I'm going to start that over. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about we have, what we have seen and heard. A couple of weeks ago, I, stand, I, I stood on this pulpit and, and during a, a sermon, I apologized for something in the gospel that may have been offend, offensive to people. And I had to retract that statement of apology because I do not feel we need to apologize for the gospel, friends. I do not feel we need to apologize for the truth. And when that happened in that moment, it, it was actually a bigger moment for me than, than what it seemed to you. It's been playing over and over and over in my head. And I made this decision that I will stand up for what God has put in my heart. And I will not preach from this pulpit what people's itchy ears want to hear. I will preach the gospel of truth. I will preach the gospel of truth with great love, great compassion, buckets of grace, friends, buckets, bucket loads. If you want to stand up and walk out of the service because you feel the preacher is preaching too much grace, friend, it's on you. I don't think there is so much, there is even a term as too much grace. If you think God's given you too much grace, friends, there is a lot more coming from there. If you think you've done too much and you do not deserve God's grace, friends, there's a lot more. There's more than you can even think or imagine. If you think you've gone too far in your sexual life, there is much more grace for you, friend. The gospel of grace, God's unmerited favor. You cannot deserve it. You, you do not deserve it. Until the gospel is not too good to be true, it is not the true gospel. It needs to be too good to be true. John Piper calls it a scandal. He says it's a scandal, it's so good. Because of what Jesus has done in my heart, I cannot stop speaking about what I've seen or heard. Am I trying to, to, to convince God or people? I'm, be, I'm speaking to people, that's what Paul is saying. I'm convincing people of the gospel. I'm not trying to change God's mind. I'm taking God's word and applying it to people. May the preaching from this pulpit please God and bring Him glory. And be, be a beautiful fragrance unto him. That is my prayer. Galatians 1.11. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from human source, and I was not taught it, but it came by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, by no means am I claiming to be of a apostolic authority, but as Paul writes to the Galatians, I want to say to you today, friends, the gospel of grace by faith, which is opposed to the gospel of religion and works, is a gospel not from human origin, but the gospel of Jesus Christ himself. It's not my gospel. It is God's gospel. It's his story. It's Jesus' story. There is no other gospel, no other way by which man can be saved but by Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, band, you guys can come up. How do I distinguish between the gospel of grace and a false gospel of religion and works? I've just jotted down some thoughts. These are really just ramblings. But this is just what God stirred in my heart as I meditated on this passage and just on the, on the context of the book of Galatians and, and on this matter of grace and, and, and law and religion and, you know, do's and don'ts. And so how do I distinguish between the gospel of grace and the false gospel of religion and works? Religion and works causes pridefulness in us. It causes me to say, look at me, look how well I'm doing. 
When we read the, the, the New Testament, the, 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 the Gospels, we see often Jesus is, is standing, uh, debating with the Pharisees and the Sadducees who stood on, on street corners. And they had these, these, these ropes with these knots in to show people how much they've repented of. Look at me. You see, that's what religion and works does. It makes us prideful. The gospel of grace, friends, leads us to humility. The deeper your understanding of the gospel grows, the more you realize you need for a savior. Man, the more I study God's word, the more I realize how wicked my heart is and how much I need Jesus Christ in my life. That is the result of the true gospel, friends. Religion and work says that you have, have to sort out your life before coming to Jesus. It's like telling a person you have to go take a bath so you can be clean to get into the shower. That's what religion and work says. Go clean yourself up before you can come take a shower. The gospel of grace says you're forgiven, come as you are. I will restore you. I will bring you back to your original design. Religion and works are a set of rules. Stop this, start that, don't do this, don't do that. Friends, if that is your view of God's word, a book of do's and don'ts, I want to suggest that maybe you've been subscribing to religion and works, not to the true gospel. The true gospel of grace is about relationship with Jesus Christ, not about do's and don'ts. It's about coming to the crosses and bitting your life and say, Lord, will you do with me as you wish, as you please? May my life be a fragrance unto you. Religion and works, set of rules. I've said that one. Religion and works says that God is out to punish you when you sin. The gospel of grace says that God punished Jesus and therefore he will never punish you. The punishment is done, friends. God disciplines those he loves, absolutely, but he doesn't punish. Jesus bore our punishment on the cross. You will not be punished by God. If the gospel that you subscribe to is a gospel that says, I will be punished, that is not the true gospel. Religion and works breeds fear. I hope I'm good enough so that God can forgive me and I can make it into heaven. Every time you sin, you step out of line or step out of line, you lose your assurance of salvation and only regain the possibility of being saved when you are good enough again. That's what religion and works says. It breeds fear. You can never in religion and works have a sense of security of salvation. There's no security. When I'm good enough, I'm saved. When I'm not good enough, I'm not saved. It's just in and out, in and out, in and out. The gospel of grace says that when you are saved, friends, you are always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. It's about freedom and security. The reality is you can never be good enough. No matter how hard you try, that's why the law could never stand. That's what the law could never achieve, is to make us good enough. Jesus was perfect. For this reason, you can have assurance of salvation because Jesus is in my place. That's the gospel, friends. Because of my salvation and relationship with Jesus, I am freed from being enslaved to my sinful nature and my desire becomes to represent Christ better. That is what the true gospel says about my moral standards. Religion and law will never lead to holy living. It may influence our behavior, but it cannot and will never change the heart of a person. We were doing this, um, this parent while we were in the middle of a parenting course on Wednesday evenings after worship and prayer. And I loved what Eli shared there. More rules will not change a child's heart. The gospel of grace. Parents, speak the gospel of grace into your, parents, uh, into your kids' lives. That will change their hearts. More rules will not change their hearts. Rules are good. It's good to have riverbanks. It's good to have something to live by. But friends, grace, grace, buckets of grace. Something happens in the heart of a believer when they have, re, uh, when they have a revelation of God's grace and their hearts and desires towards their sinful nature changes. I don't change myself, friends. 
I come and I leave my, my, my life by the cross and say, Jesus, I need you. And some miraculous way, my heart starts changing towards my sinful desires. In some miraculous way, I'm freed from those desires. And in some way, I don't know how, I look back and I say, I'm not where I want to be, but sure, I'm not where I was before. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. Religion and works breeds guilt and shame. If you are sitting here with guilt and shame this morning, friend, it's not the true gospel. The gospel of graves gives freedom, peace, and joy. Last one, religion and works sees God as a hard taskmaster. Remember the story of the talents? I think it was a two-talent guy or the one talent. Which, which guy was it? When the master came back, he hid the talent in the ground and said, I knew you were a hard taskmaster who reaps where he didn't sow. Friend, religion and works sees God as a hard taskmaster who reaps where he didn't sow. And that's not the God I serve. The God who I serve do not reap where he didn't sow. He does not reap where he didn't sow. The gospel of grace sees a loving father who wants to freely give us his Holy Spirit when we ask it. I'm going to come land my service in a minute. I'm going to ask that we stand. And I'm going to ask the band to lead us in worship. And then I'll come finish. Amen. I wanted to give us a minute to just reflect on what's been said and just turn our eyes back on Jesus. But friends, falling back into religion and works, the religion and works that you've been set free from, is like disregarding or discrediting the work of the cross. 
I could attain salvation or God's favor by works, friends, then it was no need for the cross if it was achievable. But if you're anything like me, as we're standing here in this service, you find yourself halfway down the path to that puddle of puke. Trying to earn, and already your mind is going, and already you're thinking of how I can try and earn God's favor more. And I'm being honest with you. I have to often wrestle with this thing, because in my mind it doesn't make sense. The gospel doesn't make sense, but I need the Holy Spirit to help me. I'm thinking of the of the of the disciples sitting with Jesus saying, Lord, help our unbelief. Will you help us, Lord Jesus? I tend to trust more in my own works than in God's unmerited favor. I have more faith in my own abilities than on God's unmerited favor. If this is you this morning, don't you just close your eyes and pray with me and let's ask God to to help our unfun belief. Father God, as we stand here before you, just have this picture of Adam and Eve standing in the garden when they realize they are naked and ashamed, where you created them naked and unashamed. They sin and the, and the sinfulness makes them realize their nakedness. But Father God, you come and you clothe them with your righteousness. You clothe their shame clothe their guilt so Father God will you clothe our guilt and our shame this morning will you help our unbelief I pray that there are, if there is anybody here that's, that's relied on their, on their seemingly righteous works good works will you set them free from thinking that those good works earn your favor in the same way Lord Jesus there are those that's standing here that th that's thinking, I've done too much. How can I ever be saved? How can I ever be forgiven? Father God, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will help their unbelief. I've done too much. Do you know what I've done? Renus, you don't know what I've done. Friend, do you know what Jesus has done? Two Corinthians 5 is 21. He, which is God, made the one who did not sin, which is Jesus, to be sin for us, those who are sinful by nature, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friend, Jesus became sin so that we don't have to carry the punishment of that sin, so that we may become his righteousness, so that we can be in him. Maybe here this morning in this gospel of grace, you've never heard it. You've always had this opinion of God as the hard taskmaster. And I want to invite you to receive him as your father this morning, not as a taskmaster. Jesus came to set us free from this bondage, friends. Won't you receive him this morning as your father? Won't you receive the work of Jesus on the cross? You cannot earn God's favor, friend. You cannot. Nothing you can do can make him love you more. He loves you more than what you can think or imagine or ask. God's fullness of his love is poured out on us, whether we're good or whether we are bad. So Jesus, I pray for every person that's got a revelation in their heart of who you are this morning. May they receive you right now as, they, as your personal Lord and as their personal Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, will you go into their hearts and change their hearts, make them a new creation? In Jesus' name, we pray. I'm going to close with John 16, 316. We all know it well. For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone so everyone, everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Can you say Amen? Amen. I want to make an invitation. We're going to sing this, Our God Reigns, one more time. And uh, before everybody rushes out, why don't you just linger a little bit. Give time for people to make it to the front. If you need prayer this morning, if you maybe been stuck in a rut in this gospel of work, so maybe you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this morning and you just need somebody to pray with you. If you need prayer for anything this morning, friends, I want to invite you forward as we sing this last song. The reason why I'm asking everybody to stay is because people find it difficult to, t- to come to the front and it deters them from coming out to, for prayer. So won't you stay and worship with us until the song is finished. Those that want to come to the front can come to the front. Our leaders will be here to pray with you, to stand with you in faith. Is that good? Amen. Let's, let's sing.